Great relationships don't just happen, they're designed. But how do you get the love you really want when you haven't had the models and examples you needed? We've learned the hard way that talking about stuff can change everything, but it doesn't come naturally, and that's normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the ups and downs of creating a custom-built love. We'll get personal and talk about what's worked for us, hear from Jolie about what the research can teach us about love, and answer listener questions. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Well, here we are again. Here we are. Welcome to season five, it looks like. It is. Because we're going to start off with this episode. Yep. Because it was requested so many times. Um, And I'm sure as we record other episodes, I get stuff out of order. But we're going first with this one. (laughs) This episode was requested several times, and it is about consensual non-monogamy and parenting. Or is it parenting? And consensual <laughs> non-monogamy. Yeah, yeah. I don't. You you can uh, switch that up however you want. Um, the reason I wanted to respond to it and I wanted to do so quickly is because this can feel like an an emergency to folks um, when you're when you've chosen a lifestyle that's working for you um, because. If nothing else, just like opening the door to consensual non-monogamy means that your lifestyle can shift a little bit and all of a sudden there can be new pieces. But even if you haven't started dating, there can be new conversations happening in your house. And just, it's a shift. It's a change. And I mean, when I say lifestyle, I don't mean like lifestyle choice. I mean, like how you live. You might experience some real changes. You might be going through some disentangling with your partner um, who you already live with. Um, you might be, and that disentangling might might look like a bunch of things. We can get into that. But um, but that that can bring stuff up. And bringing stuff up, like for, I'll just give a quick example. Um, maybe you decide to have separate bedrooms for a while and try that out. Or maybe forever. Right, yeah, just... Or, just- messing around seeing what just happens try trying to come figuring up figuring out with... or maybe you start going out on your own and you've never gone out on your yeah, own just trying something now, new this this is only one way to think about what it is to be um uh, experiencing i'm thinking really about folks who already have kids and are experiencing a transition from monogamy to consensual uh-huh. non-monogamy because i think when you if you've been consensually non-monogamous the whole time, and at some point you choose to have kids, there's a different set of questions, but generally speaking, you've had some time to work out, like, what does it mean? What am I doing? What are my values? How does this work for me? When you experience this transition, um, which can also be a little transformative, like, you may really change a lot, and you already have kids, that brings up a different set of concerns. Totally. And that's what I see in my... Um, when people come to see me for guidance around this transition time. But it's also what I see talked about on the internet. It's what I hear when I talk to people about this and they immediately jump to, wait, what about the kids? Yeah. And that's what the question was about, right? And that's what the question. So I received a question from a colleague, a a fellow therapist who I I just respect the heck out of. Um, In fact, let's have her on the show at some point. Erin Davidson. She she just, she and I were talking about the, the lack of resources there are around this. Um, there's not nothing, but goodness knows we could have a lot more conversation. All so right. you and I have seven kids. We've been at this now, this consensual non-monogamy thing, which most of the times I think we call we for most of those years, I think we called it polyamory. We did. I think that's what yeah. we were labeling once, it for us. Once we came up with a word to call it at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, that's another conversation. That's a, that's a conversation we'll in get into. Um, but we've been at this for over 12 years now. We've got these seven kids. The seven kids were ages 2 to 10 when we first shifted from our monogamous marriages to a consensually non-monogamous situation. Situation. I'm going to yep. say situation because, okay, pro tip number one, grown-ups figure out at least to some extent what the heck you're doing and start working on your like your own comfort with this before trying to explain it to the kids oh, yeah. if you possibly can. And when I say explain, I mean before you like sit down as if this is a 
an old school birds and bees talk. <laughs> right. But it, it, when we sit down with a child and we tell them we have to sit them down and talk to them about something, well, it's a little like hearing from your lover, we have to talk about right? something. Yeah. It's not... <laughs> It's not really... It sets up a particular tone. Right. Okay. So first things first, this is not an emergency. So everybody, you know, calm down. If you happen to be freaking out because you think, I need to know exactly what to tell the kids right away. Don't panic. My experience... Don't panic. In the immortal words of Douglas Adams, don't panic. Um, If you can possibly, for just a second... Imagine yourself on the other side of a decade. Where will your kids be in a decade? How old will they be in a decade? How old will you be? Can you imagine what your life might look like? Can you imagine what your partnerships might look like? It's challenging. But if when I step into that spot and I I cast myself a whole decade forward, the one thing I'm absolutely sure of is that everything will be different. Right. Yeah. And that what I thought was an emergency at the time will mm-hmm. probably seem like just just another wonderful day, messy day, hard day, like just just another. There are very few times that wind up being that actual emergency. There will be some, but it probably won't be this. Um, now, on the other hand, you might run across some emergency feelings. Do you have any emergency feeling memories because oh, i see, i remember you having some emergency yes, feelings. absolutely okay. i had some very feelings that very much felt like an emergency when when those came up what i'm thinking back to is those times very early in our experience before you and i had our own language mm-hmm. to talk about what it was we were <laughs> doing yeah and it was um well, the first couple years, really. Oh, my gosh. It actually, it took many it years took to develop time. the language. But the first couple years in particular, um, I mean, we had a joke. We had a running joke about not knowing what to even call each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember there being a time when you seemed really caught, really, really caught by this as if it were an emergency. Yep. And it had to do with the kids. And it had to do with... Um, not knowing what to say, and so having having shoved everything off to the corners. Would you like me to tell the story? Yeah, I, and I think so. And I just wanted to say it wasn't just about not knowing what to say. It was about not knowing how to say what I had to say. Without the language, it was oof, well, so I mean, hard. Right, yeah, learning to say things out loud hmm. that embarrass you or that you're ashamed of. Because here's the thing, at the very beginning... Both of us were dealing with internalized feelings that what we were doing wasn't quite right because other people were telling us that it wasn't quite right, even though we weren't lying and we were getting consent and we were working really hard to be um, like operating from a a strong uh, stance of of being honest and open with each other and getting all of that aside. It felt like the whole world was telling us that we were wrong and we were we were hurting people just by the very nature of what we were doing. Um, Which made the times when it seemed like there might be a problem just get magnified. Right. Because it wasn't just a problem in a, well, I'm just doing a thing. It was a problem in a, you shouldn't be doing this anyway. There you go. And a, so ugh. my thing, when we, when we were first together, I knew that vocabulary was important. I probably couldn't have said it that clearly, that crisply, but I did. I did know this and I would, I would push, I would really push for, let's figure out what we're doing. Let's, let's put a name on this. Let's, let's figure out what role I get to have in your kids' mm-hmm. lives and what role you get to have in their, in my kids' lives. That's went back when there was a yours and mine. Yep. There's now very clearly an ours. Yeah, very clearly. Um, and that's what there is. Yeah. And we didn't do yours, mine, ours by making new kids. We did yours, mine, ours by really moving into full parenting parenting of each other's children so they the kids all have more than two parents that's that's not rocket science that's just fun honestly honestly it's just fun i like having that but back to the original point us figuring out for ourselves i don't even mean us all together although that was important too at the very beginning um reading 
and we did not have access to all the books. Nope. There are some well, great resources that out have been there. written since we did this. Right. I mean, back <laughs> then, I got this. myself a copy of The Ethical Slut, which was second edition was out then, not third. And I'd, I'd gotten myself um, into a couple of old forums that kicked around the internet. And they were yeah. helpful. And people on them were trying to be helpful. But um, it wasn't like it is now where I can hand people resource sheets and I can hand them books that are that say, well, here are some options. It's not just one thing. Your consensual non-monogamy is going to be uniquely designed by you and the people you relate to. Oh my God, I I, I would have given anything for yeah. those resources oh, back then. Man, so, that would have been so useful. Right at the beginning, before there's the 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 sense that we have to talk to the kids is can I figure out for myself what feels good, what where I'm, what language I want to use to talk about my own relationship, um, what words feel good, and then start practicing them. Literally, just mm -hmm. practice saying them out loud, yeah. um, because some of these words they did, like they don't fit. They didn't fit in my mouth, and not just the words like compersion, which is was new, a whole new word to us. Compersion, the opposite of jealousy, the feeling of joy for another's joy, but um, words like polyamory, sure, but also words like um, autonomy. Yeah. Autonomy, the word autonomy, the word agency, those words didn't really fit for me in what I now would label a very enmeshed, very codependent um, yep. first marriage. And, and like by choice, like that's what we were building on purpose. So learning how to speak about relationships yeah. with clarity was so helpful. And, and I so, wish that we'd been able to do it a little, oh, you know, faster. With more, yeah, yeah gotten, faster. gotten at it faster sure. and had more resources. And what I think I hear you saying is, so there you are, your parents, and you might want to be talking to your kids about how your relationship is changing. Well, I, I think I hear you strongly recommending that they practice with each other and even alone if you have to. And but not just even if you just, have to. I think even alone. You think that's just... Absolutely. I think writing about it for yourself. Oh, yeah. Talking. Sure, right. Of like, course. It, you could literally talk out loud, but, you know, having inner dialogues even. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, literally but, talk, speaking those words out loud. I think it's incredibly helpful. It is. It is. It, it helped cement the reality that I was creating. Once I started talking about it. And talking about these things out loud didn't come easily to you. Oh, no. It was years of practice for you to to just be able to say the harder things. And when I say harder things, I mean something outside of what you believed was expected of you. Oh, and it was so much about that. Um, not so much about my strong belief in myself and who I was and thinking that I might be violating that. Now, that, that wasn't really an issue. <laughs> But other people's expectations of me were well, I, I responded to so strongly. Right. So there's the thing. So you had been non-monogamous with your partner yeah. for pretty much the whole time pretty you've been together. Pretty much the whole time, yeah. Um, but you didn't Not talk in, about it. Didn't talk never about it. Never named it. You certainly didn't never. You didn't it. claim it. it like wasn't... I mean, you didn't claim it like publicly, even though it was consensual. Like you yeah. had agreed to it. And a lot of people um, could see it. And people, we <laughs> could. Yes. We didn't. As a person who was on the outside, it. we, yeah. yes, we all saw whose cars were visiting, whose for hours and hours and overnight. Yes, we right. did. So, um, when you're able to talk about these things, now moving into the, the real meat of it, mm -hmm. what to say to the kids? What do you say to the kids? Um, step one developmental appropriateness is the, the phrase that comes to mind. But right away we get into some tricky ground here because it's not like there's some hard and fast guideline that says when your kid is X no, age there's no or has reached this. this stage yeah. or what, like, it's not really always clear exactly what developmental stage your kids are to you. Like, I, I, like I, when I think about even now, I have to stop and really consider what phases the kids are going through and, and where they really are. Mm -hmm. So... When I say developmentally appropriate information sharing, what I mean is we're, we're not going to sit down and give a huge, you know, <laughs> talk about our sex lives to our kids anyways, but you, the kind of words you use that might include, you know, using the word sex or using the word intimate 
well, I might use that with my 16, 17, 18, 22 year olds, but I don't, I didn't use those words when the kids were right. seven. Yeah. Um, because it didn't make sense to them. Something we did talk about a lot though, in those early days. So the kids were between two and 10 years old when we started down this road. Right. And we talked about friendship a lot. Yep. And that I'm very glad we did. Yeah. Um, that was sort of by accident, um, because we didn't know what else to call it since we didn't know how to say, we didn't know the word, we didn't even know what words we could use and we weren't comfortable with boyfriend, girlfriend, like on top of marriage. It, yep. we weren't clear, but friendship. So we talked about friendship. We talked about close friendships. We talked about best friendships. Um, we talked about, uh, sharing time and spending time with yep. people and getting to know them and. That all went really well. That and I think all, deepened I, the conversation around what it meant to be a grown up. Like, oh, you get to have friends, in fact, more friends. Most yeah. of us know that we don't expect exclusivity and friendship, but then as soon as as soon as sex even appears huh. to enter yep. the sphere now, anywhere near something, now all of a sudden we act like we're talking about something else. Tangled. So I liked that we started with friendship. And that was great, especially when the kids were really younger, but now the kids are between 14 and 22. So in the intervening years, yeah, that the languaging has had to change a lot. And there was there was an important uh, thing that happened in there, which was, um, so we did we talk. I mean, you talk about stuff all the time, and it's awesome. And you were you were pulling, um, in, encouraging and. And uh, pulling me to, to talk more and um, my partner too. So so I would talk with you about what we were doing. I would talk to my partner about what you were, what we were doing. Then you would do the same thing. And so would my partner. And But we all came at it from a different enough point of view that when each of us would talk to the kids... They would get they a different would get a, explanation. They would get different like and, and conflicting in some cases. Yeah. And that was... So we uh, all could get on the same page trouble. Yeah. in some context yeah. on our own. But yep, there was a there was a shift and, when we would... And this came at, from a bunch of different directions because let's name a big elephant in the room. Morty? Some people... Oh, I Morty wish it was just elephant? Morty the Elephant. No, it's not, no, though. It's not. It's... Um, DCF and Ugh, exes yeah. threatening to take kids away yeah. and fear about our our livelihoods if we're out. Yeah. Um, the stresses on the conversations, knowing what possible ramifications were out there. So we were dealing with a few different d pressures. Um, on my side, I mean, I was dealing with an ex who at first tried to yeah. manipulate this into getting the kids full time. Mm -hmm. Um, as we were divorcing, I would not wish that on my worst enemy, but, um, but having said, having said that it, it did make it very clear to me that I was willing to, like, I was willing to draw a line in the sand and say, this is, this is me, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. And I, and I fought really hard and, um, my court battle went well. And things worked out. But I, I want to just say, if you are in the closet because you have very real fears around um, litigation or around safety, or like, we're not suggesting that you should be out. Yeah, so That's every single your thing we're situation talking about is, yours. is from our, our experiences, you from know our perspectives. You know what your safety limits are. And also... Um, things change really, you know, fairly quickly. There's a national conversation to some degree. I mean, I'm interviewed regularly yeah. about this many, many times a month. I'm interviewed about this for big publications. And, um, when we were first starting out 12 years ago, that, that information wasn't there. Yeah. So I will say, while there is more conversation, that doesn't mean that your world feels safe right. enough to have this conversation. Yeah. So I get it. Let's just imagine for a second that um, that you are in a set. Well, I'm going to imagine a person into being, and they're going to be in a situation where they are able to feel safe enough 
They're not feeling like an ex is going to sue them or try to take the kids or try to um, harm their livelihood in any way. They're not feeling like there's that that level of survival stress. Mm -hmm. Not going to lose their job. Not going to lose their job. Yeah, survival level stress. But they're just still concerned because we had another kind of pressure that was going on. And that was actually coming from from your side of the equation there was yep. there was pressure from in-laws and yeah. and that and 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 that level that external family of the um the next level out of family and friends and their okay. their well-meaning concern yes i will say well-meaning with a great big caveat i don't know how well-meaning it is when you're when you um your intention doesn't appear to be to get actual clarity right. about the feelings and instead is about adhering to a norm yep. yeah. first. I actually really, I, I have a big bone to pick with people who will say a norm is more important to uphold than honest, consensual, agreed upon happiness. That yeah. just pisses me off. So. Agreed. I'm imagining these, these folks similar to the situation we we were in where you were experiencing pressure that was coming from like you had a kid who shared with a grandparent that um you and I were sitting close together on a couch and and like um the grandparent was told that we were cuddling and that shifted everything yep like all of a sudden the the tone and how the, the control the level of control about what I was supposed to do shifted all of a sudden, there were new rules in play. And this was, oh, goodness, about a year yeah, in. Early. It was about a year into the relationship. So this is a long way in. And all of a sudden now, I I couldn't touch you when yeah, the kids it, were around. And and that was, it was so challenging on many, in, for many reasons. I mean, for one thing, I loved you and I wanted to be able to, you know, just be a person around you and and you know hold your hand occasionally and and things right but it was also that we'd already told the kids yeah, things we'd already right. been clear this, with the kids about the closeness that there was and i was living in your house and this was part of the so, conflict that they experienced right. about what was going on in their lives cuz now they started getting another story from a different angle and this is where it got really messy because now now the kids started to be treated like they were overly fra- there was a fragilization like That's as a- if they couldn't handle the yeah. reality when they'd been handling it really well <laughs> they they've been dealing with it really well yeah. we'd been experiencing a lot of joy they, i mean there was a divorce going on on my side so there was a lot of there was a lot of struggle over there especially with my oldest upheaval, child um trouble yeah she was 10 her. and she was very very resentful about divorce cuz you know kids often are yep. and that divorce was not pretty but um but the change that happened that i that i remember it was it was a tough one it was all of a sudden there were new rules and the rules weren't about what any of the adults in this relationship actually wanted they were about keeping up appearances for other people they were completely about appearances that yep. was so challenging so back to developmentally appropriate um, the kids we were talking about are, you know, at this age, two to ten. So they were two, three, three, five, seven, seven, and ten. Or six, seven, and ten. Six, seven. <laughs> um, okay. Using language about friendship, about multiplicity. Using, not the word multiplicity, but talking about having more than one friend in your life. Talking about... Um, Sharing resources with each other, like share, sharing our households, um, building a, a family together. Those things all went pretty well in many ways. Because um, kids understand that sort of thing. Kids understand about, you know, grocery shopping yeah. and buying food for the people who are in your house. And right. Kids understand um, that, that level of talk, you know, which movie are we going to watch? Well, let's get everybody's input. It's not as though we were sitting down to talk to them about who was having sex with who. No. I don't do that with my adult children either. 
and they're very glad they're for happy it. about <laughs> so that yeah. i'm guessing people are laughing but here's the thing i mean that's the level of inquiry we would get so if you are struggling right now because you're feeling pressure from people saying what about the children and you're worried about what to tell the children yeah let's remember that kids really don't care or want to know about their parents nope. sex lives so we had all those conversations <laughs> and largely you with your facility with with relational conversations but we had these conversations with the children um kind of re repeatedly updating them with or not updating you know just letting them know well things were changing so, well, the relationships were, changing. were deepening true. and shifting yep. yeah so and, uh, it was an updating and and it was it was the and our language was coming along it was the frequency of the conversations as much as anything i mean there was no and i don't believe there could be a single conversation that you just have and say so this is what's going on and now that the children have all understood everything and and they they know what's going on it's a repeated conversation over time partially because and and this is kind of uh my own little story of and it's not just mine but so i'm by and I have come out to people as being a bi man re repeatedly. Over like the over. same person I have done it repeatedly. Oh, because, so many times. Because <laughs> and I'm like, so so I'm bi. I mean, it doesn't, you know. You announce it on Facebook. To whatever. Oh, you yeah. I announce it on Facebook. <laughs> and, and say it. And you then, wear the shirts. And then, I, and then I talk to somebody that I know or has already seen this information. And they're like, what? Really? Yeah? Oh. What's that like, or whatever? Um, why? Mostly, they don't just, even ask questions. I don't know what that, but yeah, I don't know why? What that's why? But so repeatedly, I had to say it again and again to the same people because they just wouldn't hear it. Kids are the same way. I mean, kids are the same way about all kinds of things. Yeah, that way. I mean, they don't do listen. The, they clean the counters, do the dishes. Listen. Funny, they didn't hear that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we had to tell several of them uh, a few times, or when we would tell them. So you know how you know we're we're not just married to each other but we have relationships with other people they're like what yes and then the next time they're like what <laughs> right so they don't hold on to that but what they absolutely and very clearly did hold on to was all the other parts of the conversations that we had with them about um how relationships can be what is good for you and you can extend out beyond the recipes that you've been given about how you can have relationships. Now, something that was very helpful was having the conversations. Um, I think of all relationship conversations as happening in a spiral. So, you, you know, if you imagine yourself starting at the center and you start walking along and you have a conversation, you just keep coming back to the same mm -hmm. topics or the same stuff over and over again as you walk along that spiral. You you know, you come back to that segment, but each time it's, you know, it's a spiral. It's not a concentric circle. Right. It's, so you got a slightly it, different take on yeah, it. Yeah. A new take with new information. new information. The kids get older. You learn more. We yeah. have more relationships. One of the, one of the things that really helped me was remembering that the kids were witnessing us real time, experiencing the highs and lows, the ups yes. and the downs, yes. because... Like, I met somebody this past summer, and it was great for, like, a month and a half. It was awesome. It was, I was flying high as a kite. It was super exciting and yummy for me. And then all of a sudden, she ghosted me. Just gone. Just, she was just gone. And because the kids are, like, uh, they're older and just complete, they were just aware. They were aware I was dating. They were like, where are you going? Out on a date. Who are you, who are you seeing? And, and I would say, oh, this person. And they were like, that's great. Great for you. And then when, when the ghosting happened, obviously with ghosting, you don't really know what happened. So there's like this pause. And then there came the day when I was like, I have to grieve this. I'm sad. This is over. Um, I didn't have to hide that from the kids. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't, make a big deal about it in front of them, but they saw me sadder, a little mopey and, and confused. Um, I'm certain they heard me shed some tears in my office. But, you know, whoever happened to be around, it, it wasn't a huge deal, but, but they witnessed me experiencing that low and you supporting, you, they witnessed you supporting me through that heartbreak. I I can't imagine anything more. Um, it's this intricate, interwoven like. 
no conversation could relay to them the importance of these of this way of relating. Right. The but they could see it. It's right there. Right. Because in that moment, you weren't you weren't relating to me as husband or partner or lover. You were actually relating to me so directly as friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Friend first. My friend is hurting. Yep. And that was so obvious to them. And one of the ways that I know that this has translated is that um, one of the kids came up to me, one of the older kids who, you know, is uh, less touchy-feely at this point and such, and just gave me a hug. Just gave me a hug because yeah. he knew I was sad. Simple. And I don't think that that would have felt safe if there had been years of hiding and secrecy right. and confusion yep. and or if this was like if there was shame wrapped around our non-monogamy and it's taken a lot to unpack the shame that other people ask us to carry about our relating oh yeah that's a so if you're currently experiencing some lingering feelings of shame or confusion or or you're not even sure but you're experiencing a lot of worry about what the kids will think or what other people will think I I would just ask you to reflect on well, why is that? Are you have is you it, is that your yeah. own is internalized yours, actual is it... feeling? Is that like is that your? I mean, not your internal. Is that your actual truth, or is that you terrified that even your children will judge you, right? Or that you really are wrong? Is that are your children just a mirror at that moment where you're actually judging yourself? as being wrong or bad for wanting more and if you are well there's the stuff to start unpacking i would say worry less about exactly what words we tell the kids and more about really doing the inner work of getting clear with ourselves about what we're doing of creating shared vocabulary with our partner and then sharing it in the household having that be the normalization words like um, words like consensual non-monogamy, polyamory, compersion, sure, but also words like agency and autonomy and yeah. and um, friendship and support and empathy, empathy, and <laughs> giving words. these words mean like really like giving them meaning yep. by explaining like what you're doing as you're doing it, as you're doing it where they can see it. Because yeah. I'm watching now our teenagers, you know, starting to have relationships with other people, romantic relationships, and and seeing how. We are we continue to be the, the you know the the, the up close model of open relating that they are aware of, and so letting ourselves be in that, but also doing the work of unpacking my own internalized mm-hmm. you know monogamous biases and stuff because I swim in the sea. We're still growing up, you know. These kids are still growing up in this world, exposed to stories and songs and everything that are going to tell them a certain way of relating is correct, and so. There's a lot to circle back to, to, you know, to, to walk, really like is. keep coming back to and, and reaffirming that this is a way. This is a way. To and, and not it's all not of our kids. It's not a correct way. It's just, um, it's just a way. Think it's that just, it's right for them. Right. Yeah. We yeah. have, we have some kids who are very clear. They're like, oh no, I am definitely on team monogamy. That's just what works for me. That's what I want. That's what I feel is right for me and mine. And that's, and you do you. And we don't um, we don't advocate for no. ethical non-monogamy or consensual non-monogamy or polyamory or whatever you want to call it. We don't advocate for it. Everybody's different. It's whatever's going on for you that works for you right then. Right. So, and here's another thing is we, we talk to the kids about, and this I would encourage lots of people to think about, we talk to them about um, the flexibility that we each have, like, You and I, you know, here we are, you know, dating during a pandemic. There have been highs, there have been lows, there have been times when we're dating, times when we're completely closed down, times when we're very, very um, particular, even more so than we had been before the pandemic. The pandemic upped the ante on that. And so talking to them about the fact that we have to do a lot of internal checking on what our boundaries are right now and what we we have the capacity to have relationally. Um, so whether they are, um, interested in our consensual non-monogamy or not, those conversations are valuable. Those conversations apply to their friendships, apply to their, just their general 
growing process. So when I think about developmentally appropriate now, what I mostly think about is talking to the kids, like people, like the, like, yep. the, you know, your kids. So rather than trying to explain it to them top down, have the conversations from a place of like, what are they actually asking? What do they actually want to know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They want to know that, um, you know, that, that they're safe and, and well loved, you know, like they want to feel loved, but it's, they also, they want to feel the comfort of the people around them. Yeah. They'll know if you're, if you're actually miserable in this arrangement that you've made, if you, if you're not happy, they'll know that. We saw that firsthand. We did. And this was something that it took me a while to really integrate into my parenting, assuming I even have, which is that, so they watch what we do. And they're going to normalize that. So if we're miserable, they're going to go out and look for miserable relationships. Yeah. And I don't want that for them. So the conversations with them about what works for us and how we think relating should go in general, those even for the kids who don't, um, who aren't, who are on team monogamy, those conversations are still relevant. Totally. And it's been an ongoing process to to let ourselves keep getting comfortable with yeah. yep we we don't always know exactly exactly what's going to happen or how our relating is going but we can have the conversations and show the kids that we are resilient that, yeah, that we are resilient. Right. We're resilient as a family as well as. And one of the things, we've talked about this before. You and I um, usually call each other anchor partners. Mm -hmm. um, and this is our arrangement. Our arrangement is that we've agreed to to hold the closeness, the parenting role of closeness, even if we decide not to be romantically involved. We decided to co-parent together in perpetuity. Yep. And that... Um, you know, no social rule requires us to because we each have biological children. We don't share any biological children. Like we somehow could get off the hook, but that's just not what we not agreed interested to do. In Adam, we didn't well, it's agree. just not what we agreed to do. Um, and we've been we've been um, practicing that, like just yep. being in that reality. Yeah. And it's. Um, that, so that's where we can demonstrate the resilience and also creating our vocabulary right. with the kids. Um, our resilience is as a family. How will we care for each other? How will we take care of emergencies and tough stuff? Yep. Um, so we started this episode and I was talking about this not being an emergency. Explaining things to the kids not being an emergency. Yep. Um, kids are very... They are both paying super close attention and also paying no attention at all. It's, you know, there's the paradox of having, you know, an 11-year-old or whatever. Um, there isn't a right answer. But if you can start turning toward an internal sense of, am I in alignment with my own values? We talk a lot about knowing what mm -hmm. your core values are and what the core values of your relationship is and, and what the purpose of your relationship is. If you know those, then these conversations become easier. Yep, they do. Um, and if what you're really asking, and so behind some of these questions about how should I tell the kids is, what do I do if the kids tell someone else? That's a different issue. That's, That's different when your issue. fear your yeah. fear is actually about the other other person. And so if we can start to tease that apart and say, if what your fear is doesn't have to do with the kids, well, there's something else to work on. How do I want to present in the world? How do I want to um, introduce myself? How do I want to claim yeah. or not claim or yep. be out or not out? And then we can get down to some of the the finer details around, how long do I want to be seeing someone before I would introduce them mm -hmm. to my kids? And if I did introduce them to my kids, under, like, what label? Because I've been introduced to um, some of my partner's children as a friend, which is a completely accurate label. Their kids were younger, and it just it had no barrier. Our, our level of physical intimacy had no bearing on yeah. what their children were experiencing, and it was joyful for me to get to be around their kids. That was exciting. On the other hand, I have brought people here and introduced them to the kids and the kids know that we're dating and 
cool. It it's fine. It's it's been great. You'll know what is right for you. Yeah. Probably after taking some actions, probably after doing some things that feel sketchy or scary to you. And, I want to be just really real. Yeah. You're probably going to feel like this is scary territory. And while, you know, I don't, I don't want to rush anybody into anything. This is th like you're writing your own rules. Right. And those things that feel sketchy. And like you go and you talk to one of your kids or your kids and, and you say some stuff and you're like, I'm not sure if this is what I wanted to say or how I wanted to say it. And then they, they respond the way they respond. Now you've got a conversation with them. Yeah, there's And that's the, thing. the goal. That's the whole point is to have the conversation about what's going on in your life, in their lives, in what the future might look like for all of you. It's like it it's okay if it feels a little, a little clunky shaky or, or clunky because... Then you get to have the conversation, which is the thing that's going to get you the yeah the richness. Right. It. And we've had that happen in our family. Oh, yeah. You know, our middleest child. Love those um, times. You know, didn't... She had had exposure to this since she was five years old. She understood that we had other relationships. Um, and we'd explained it many times um, in, in language that she seemed to understand. And then one day when she was about 10, we realized that she was having this long conversation with her cousin about um, how her parent, her, her mom and da had a, an arrangement where she, where they could cheat. <laughs> and we were like, I mean, it was kind of adorable. That was the language she had because she was swimming in a world of monogamy, a world that told her that. Anybody other than your spouse or your, your main partner, your, your squeeze, your beau, was cheating. Yeah. So she didn't mean cheating in the sense that there was any secrecy because she knew that that was against the rule. When I asked her to explain what she meant, she's like, no, no, no I know you're, you're honest with each other. But, you know, cheating. It was actually a pretty socially adept way of communicating with people who were pretty hardcore monogamous. Right. She it, was it, it communicated it. the situation in a completely clear way and she didn't have to come up with new words for it. Right. So, but it also opened it a also conversation opened a that conversation. let us realize that we were going to have to come back and revisit the, the basic premise of consensual. Yep. Big old capital C here. Consensual non-monogamy versus non-consensual non-monogamy, which is cheating. So it's cheating. So when... When we realized that that was the norm, so that was about five years into our escapades here, yeah. that feels like a turning point for me. So I think that our listeners who are dealing with this issue, I think that they will have those turning points where they're like, oh, yeah, so the kids are starting to take some of this in, they understand it, but only in certain ways, and it, some yeah. of it gets scrambled, and yeah, that reminds me of all the rest of your parenting. Exactly, exactly. If this is just another piece of yep. it. And for those great big fears that come up around what other people are going to think, if we can sort those out into the big, scary, like, oh my gosh, legal ramifications Actually, stuff yeah, or risky. like survival level versus what are we afraid of what other people think of us? And are we trying to adapt to norms rather than living authentically? And that is something absolutely to bring to your counselor, your therapist, your mm -hmm. um, your coach. Who your your close friends and confidants who you feel you can work through through those things, that stuff is great material to actually help you get the depth that this kind of relating can totally, bring. Totally, because yes. unpacking that stuff so much to gain. From there, it. yeah, there's the win. Yeah, yeah. So this was a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate having had it, and we're going to yeah. wrap it here. And I think we'll come back and we'll talk about oh, yeah. at some point in the future. Um, parenting children who have alternative relationship styles who have um yeah. alternative gender expressions and all that yeah, parenting because that. there's the other side of this yeah how do we how do we handle how it we if handle we're their more normative of, and they mm -hmm. are the ones pushing right? us or or challenging us or maybe they're challenging us because they love normality that like they love fitting in um, <laughs> yeah or that, just because they want to challenge us okay there's that too <laughs> okay <laughs> so this was a great conversation for me and to all of you out there keep talking to each other thanks so much for tuning in to this episode I've got one more thing I'd like to share with you and that 
You're just going to need to hop over to the website listentojolie.com. There you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Go get those guides. They're great. They're easy to implement conversations that will help you take action in creating the love you really want. It's my mission to make absolutely everything talk aboutable. She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my, my lovers, my friends, my family, and you um, on a podcast. Out loud relationship work really can change everything. That really is a wonder. One of my favorite things in the whole world. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way that you'd hoped in your relationships, I want you to remember that relationships can be messy and that's good news.